can the first yours or no? Let's see what can some. Thank you very much. So welcome everybody. And the professor is right, I should finish my PhD, but I enjoy talking about my project to you. So I'm very excited to talk to you about what we did in the last few years. Um, so I present you uh, the, the fourth case of the smart city, but also some uh, features of A2XX and some features of my research. And the subtopic is how to design and engineer digital products. This is my, my agenda, so I give a short introduction uh, about the topic, then I give an even shorter introduction about cyber-physical systems, so everybody has some sort of understanding on this topic, and then I explain in detail this Smart City Case 4 in three experiments, uh, one of which will be a live demonstration. And I would like to start in analogy to Professor Karagiannis with this introductory slides with our observation that in the age of Internet of Things we develop digital products. And these digital products are enabled by the connectivity of cyber things and physical things, things in the Internet of Things. So for example, previously 10 years ago you would buy a bike. Or maybe if you were really fancy you would rent a bike for a week or a, a day. But this situation changes uh, in the age of Internet of Things, where we are able to create this new kind of digital product for on-demand mobility. And there are two examples in Vienna that did this kind of thing. So here are two providers. And of, but of course, this is not only possible for bicycles, but for all kinds of devices and products. And they interact with each other in the Internet of Things. So here are two examples from Vienna, or the first example, as you can see on the slides, for, the, for a digital product for on-demand mobility in Vienna. And this is a very successful company, uh, and here you see their bicycles uh, nicely orderly at one of their stations. So here is the second provider. They offer the same product, they offer on-demand mobility. The first one is successful, the second one, the people of Vienna got so mad at that they started to throw their bikes into the rivers. Now there are a lot of details why this happened. One of the main aspects is that maybe people in Vienna don't like their, their bikes in front of the beautiful buildings and in the parks and everywhere cluttered around, but orderly parked. Anyway, so what what can we identify, or we can identify some elements for this on-demand mobility digital product. Of course, we need some kind of bike. If we have a bike, we also need to think about locking this bike somewhere. Of course, we cannot distribute keys, just like in the smart car example, we need some electronic way of how to lock the bikes. If we need some electronics, we also need a battery, or at least some way to generate power. Then we have to think about where do, do these things park. If they cannot park anywhere, we need parking stations or physical stations. There are electronics, there is a display. Um, if I have two physical stations, people can register there. If I don't have, they have to use apps um, to bill or for maybe for other services that they can use. If I have apps and these stations, I need a lot of connectivity. I need GPS boards. I need uh, VLAN boards or, or mobile networks. And of course, we cannot forget, uh, all of this is only possible if the company that offers this product uh, it operates on a positive revenue, so we need a business plan, we need to know what is the customer operation, we need to understand the whole ecosystem, we need to distribute the bikes in the whole city. All of this is a more abstract uh, business plan and of course then there are more abstract things like there are bike laws in a, different cities have different laws um, The culture in different cities and in different populations and is different and there are also is also politics involved So really this is a very big spectrum from physical parts until politics and culture um, The point is that there is a very high complexity of all these involved elements 
And we have to ask ourselves the question, how can we design a successful digital product? Well, these providers, like in the two examples that I showed you, they should have asked themselves what makes the product successful. Um, but this is even more complicated because business experts continuously try to uh, innovate the business elements that are involved. And at the same time, the technical engineers try to uh, innovate the technical side. Um, and like Miron, Elena Miron talked in the first session today, uh, there is uh, business feasibility to consider, so we have to think about revenue um, and parking space providers, but there is also a technical feasibility to consider. We need uh, some deep learning to allocate the, or distribute the bikes in the town and so on. And we need the locks and the, the VLAN boards and all these things. And the point is that the right combination of all these involved elements make or break our digital product or your digital product. Um, so we tried to think about this whole domain and how to connect the business experts and technical engineers in a human center environment in workshops. And we identified these two big areas and we say there is a scenario layer where uh, business experts and all kinds of people talk, like in design thinking workshop, talk in a very intuitive manner that requires a lot of insight and human knowledge. And on the other side, there are these technical engineers that think about the runtime environment, they think about cyber-physical systems, uh, they deal with all this analog world about data information and so on. Um, and like I mentioned, in, in this kind of space in Omilab, we try to bring both sides together. So we try to bring together the business side and the technical engineering side. Um, but, so this is the human factor of what we do. But the technical factor is we can also relate these two worlds with technologies. So for example, with the semantic technologies, artificial intelligence, or knowledge engineering. And you can imagine this very easily. If we have some machine learning algorithm, we can extract from all the data from this side, we can extract knowledge that we can use on the business side. Or we can implement an uh, expert uh, system that takes knowledge from this side and somehow operates systems on this side. So this is the whole topic that, that we discuss about. And we address it in this digital product space in Omilab, in Omilab Vienna. And uh, this is my sub-project, is the Omilab Rob that we built. And maybe this reminds you of what Professor Munkin Lee presented today. They built a similar infrastructure in Korea. And again, we have here the scenario layer where we do this design thinking and we provide tools for the business aspects and very creative aspects of the problem. And we provide a space for the runtime environment where we think about how to design and engineer uh, cyber physical systems. But we don't want to see these two things separated from each other, but we want to bring this together. So we try to integrate the scenario layer and all the activities on it with the runtime environment with the cyber physical systems in an agile way. And our integration approach, of course, is conceptual modeling. Um, and I can explain this a little bit in detail. So there are, of course, some other research groups, and their scenario is to imitate humans. And they take this scenario and they implement it on the robot. So maybe they create code, and this code runs on the robots. Or in the industry 4.0 domain, they try to support processes, they program these processes on the robots, and the robots do a good task at these specific things. But this is not the focus of our research group. Um, instead, we want to capture this scenario layer, this very abstract world, like we saw in the first session today. We want to capture it in conceptual models and refine the conceptual models even further, and we call them smart models, and one attribute of this smart model is, is that they can then be executed on the, uh, on, by cyber-physical systems 
in runtime environments. This is the idea. And here we can see some examples of domains why this could be useful. So, of course, what is already done today is that some architect, architects create a model of a house to be built. But what happens then, you need some humans to understand these models, to put them again to build the house from these models. But it would be nice if this model alone would be enough, or maybe enriched with some knowledge, uh, that cyber physical systems could build a house. The same, same concept, a different domain, is elderly care. So here you have the human experts, they create these really fancy plans. They know that the elder people like to rest after the lunch, so here is an empty block. So all this knowledge exists on a human level and it is put into some sort of models. But of course it would be nice if cyber physical systems could understand these models and behave accordingly. The third example is from IKEA. Uh, once you, if you ever have built a furniture from IKEA, you know it can be sometimes frustrating. Frustrating. It would be nice if a robot could do this for me. Okay, so this slide shows the framework in an overview, so a more formal way of what I just said. Again, we can see here the scenario layer, the modeling layer, and the runtime environment. And the idea is to abstract functional capabilities from the runtime environment onto the modeling layer, at the same time to decompose domain concepts from the scenario layer on the modeling layer. You do this independent of the domain, and this Professor Karagian has also talked about today. To enable this, we need all kinds of infrastructure, and especially software, and that's where the software engineering part comes in. So, there is a problem. Now, this is a nice idea, I, I hope, I think, uh, but there, there is a problem. Um, we know how to build conceptual modeling. We know how to decompose the scenario layer on the modeling layer. Or at least we have a lot of knowledge in this domain. Uh, so, conceptual models usually are built by humans for human use. Now, if we want extended functionality in the Internet of Things, then cyber physical systems also have to understand these models. And the main problem, maybe in my opinion, is that these models contain a lot of informal knowledge that is very hard to understand for machines. That's the most, that's why we need smart models that can be understood by cyber physical systems. And here you have a quote from current literature that says that few of models support, so there are very few tools that support executable models. So it's from 2018, so it's a very contemporary problem. So you might wonder, okay, what are these smart models? What am I talking about? Um, so this is our idea. So on the, one, on the bottom here, you can see a lot of concepts from conceptual modeling. And here you see some algorithmic concepts for engineers of cyber physical systems. So you have two topics that address the problem area. And they both have their modeling methods. And conceptual modeling focuses on creating new modeling languages for humans to use. And the other side possibly focuses more on algorithms that can run on cyber physical systems. And this, this is the result that we have some tools that are very established in the business domain, tools for producing BPMN models, for example, or goal models or whatever. And on the other side, we have some tools that are more used in industry um, and so on. And there is a problem when we try to integrate these two things. So we have conceptual models, we have our cyber physical systems, separated, both work well, but once we try to combine them, we have a problem. So the, the approach is, the smart model approach is to create, create a generic concept um, for all of these things, for conceptual modeling and these cyber physical systems and intelligent processing, and then build smart models using these generic concepts. And this generic concept can then be added to our knowledge base. So this is a quick um, overview. And remember, 
This is possible because of the framework Professor Karl Giannis introduced, where we can define a modeling language, and in addition, we can define these modeling mechanisms and algorithms in combination in a meta model. Right? That's, so that's what I'm talking about. So now, uh, just a, a quick introduction about cyber-physical systems, so we are on the same level when we talk about this term. Um, so here you can see an overview fly, slide for a cyber-physical system. Really, it's uh, a very quick introduction. It's a combination of computation, communication of control, usually structured in some so, uh, hierarchical architectures, like you can see. So there are different ways on how to structure these architectures, but at the bottom you have some physical elements and at the top you have most likely have some cyber elements in the, maybe in the cloud. So this is a, a traditional view on cyber physical systems. And here I have a slide with examples, hopefully. <laughs> So, this is uh, on the fourth floor here, so we built some mock-up cyber-physical system. Nothing as fancy as in Japan, because they have a little bit more funding, but given what we have, we built a lot of different cyber-physical systems, focusing on very different ways. So you could say there was a humanoid one, there was a, these ones they were driving, there was these robotic arms, there was a tracking camera system, so we tried to diversify a lot. Um, now, I said, okay, it's, it's complicated to combine conceptual modeling and cyber-physical systems. That is, given these hierarchical architectures. But the problem gets even more severe at the moment where they switch these cyber-physical system architectures, like these hierarchical architectures. And you can imagine it's rather easy to find an interface between conceptual models and this topmost hierarchy. So you could define an interface like this. But the current trend is to switch to service-oriented architectures where everything is much more chaotic and probably enriched with semantics and we have to find a way to bridge this gap. So the problem gets even more severe and again here you have some uh, literature. So some word on microservices, I, I know everybody of you probably knows this concept, but the idea is to switch away from single deployable entities from this architecture towards a more flexible architecture where uh, things can be combined more in a more agile way. But of course, not only for databases, but if we think about cyber-physical systems, then also for kinds of sensors and actuators and so on. So we want to get away from these monolithic architectures uh, towards a more flexible architecture also for cyber-physical systems. Good, so this is the quick introduction. If you have a question until here, maybe it would be a good time to ask it now, because the, otherwise I would talk about the experiments that we did in our laboratory. Okay, well, otherwise you can think about the question until the end. So, I would like to present the first experiment, and I would like to do this as a live demonstration. I tried the live demonstration two times and it worked two times. So let's see. Um, so here is our smart city experiment. Um, and in this case, again, we have a scenario in mind and a runtime environment. The runtime environment you can see easily here on the picture. So here are some of these cyber physical systems on a mock up model of a city. And the scenario behind it is that we want to have a conceptual model that can be used to distribute and steer these uh, cyber-physical systems. So the first step would be just based on the model to have the option to move these cyber-physical systems around. Now, with in the back of your mind that the scenario could be to redistribute bicycles or smart cities around, uh, smart cars around the, the town. So again, so we have to combine some, how we have to combine our runtime environment with this scenario. And here you can see the smart model that we want to use for this. So on the, on the left 
most side, you see the model of concepts that are used. So you all know about IDOXX right now and how you can define these concepts. So here are the classes that are then used to build a model that uses concepts. So something similar you saw at the exercises today, right? Um, but this, our idea of smart model uh, is a little bit extended from what we did in the classrooms today. So we try to interact with the cars based on the model. We try to send sensor data from the car into the model. We want to have the logic of how the cars behaves into the model. We want the model to tell the car what to do next. Um, and we want the modeler to have the option of decision if some, something happens. So this was uh, how we developed it, or how the team developed it. So the goal was to have a generic tool functionali fu functionality um, so that we can build smart models that enable us to use cyber-physical systems via microservices. And we started out in a, uh, just like do, you did today, so we defined our concepts, and in addition we defined an ADO script for some simulation, custom simulation of these two cars in the city. Then we refined this simulation, then we programmed the inputs with some very atomic functionality, uh, and we switched to microservices, and then we integrated the simulation script and the microservices of these cyber-physical systems. Here is the concept again of the experiment. So you can see the smart city model here. It executes this simulation other script. The other script sends HTTP requests. And uh, the cyber-physical system, in this case this small car, is powered, or the computation at least, is powered by the Ras uh, Raspberry Pi. And the, this Raspberry Pi offers some very atomic microservices for this cyber-physical system. Um, and this concept allows us to have an integration between a conceptual model and a cyber-physical system on the tool level. So this can be added to any tool you develop, and this function is available. So here is some uh, technical information on how it is done or where you can download this tool, this building block for A2XX. Uh, so here you have the link, you can download and install it and there is a good uh, explanation and uh, DevOps how to do this. So again, we need some custom Edo script that uses uh, a finished building block that just calls HTTP requests that communicate in the, in the web with our microservices that are running on the mbots. Uh, and on the mbots, they are deployed with Tomcat, but could be any, could be a chatty server as well, so it does not matter. So any REST services supported by this building block, at least. Okay. So this was the A2XX part, and maybe some notes on the cars. So here you see more detail on one of these cars. Um, you can see here is the Raspberry Pi with a camera module. There are some batteries welded on top. There were line following sensors down here and obstacle avoidance sensors, so ultrasonic sensors. There is this M board, Arduino board, uh, and the M board itself, so the physical parts, the wheels, the engines, the motors, and so on. So these are the physical parts. The cyber parts you can see here. So this is, in, in today's world, it's very easy to write the uh, web service. So this part is just the definition of the web service that is then running on some web server. And here is the internal method to control the physical car. Of course, it's a little bit more complex. We wrote a class here uh, that controls the car, but generally there is, it's a manageable complexity to design such a system. The, the question is, how can we make this system behave in an intelligent manner, of course. Mm, okay, some more, again, some information on the ADOXX. Uh, so, of course, we needed to create a modeling tool for ADOXX. 
because this is the environment where our scripts are running, this is where our model is, and this is where this DLL from the previous slide, so from this slide, this is a DLL, is executed. Uh, this DLL makes HTTP requests, so it opens a connection to the uh, web service that is provided by the car. It sends the request and waits for the response. Um, and to make this communication more easy, there, is, there are predefined 80xx and 80 script procedures where it is very simple to call this DLL, and again, it is more description you can find here. Uh, and then you need one part, you need some kind of custom part that calls this functionality. So a little bit, you have to be do like one line of code to call uh, a HTTP request from A2XX. Uh, here is the line of code that is actually calling the, the DLL. So it's very, okay, maybe it's four lines, but here we have a little bit more complexity. So there is already an if and else, and depending if it's a road like this or a road like this or a corner, it, the car makes different movements. But basically you see it's a one-liner one calling these HTTP requests. So in this, this script would be started if the simulation in RX6 is started, which I will demonstrate shortly. Um, yeah. So now we have a live demonstration of this system in action. So here we have a live stream of the laboratory. So this is five floors above us, and maybe next week you will find a chance to visit this. So here you can see the map uh, as it is built up there. You can see it's a live picture. Somebody is sitting there. Um, good. Then I need the model. And I have to position this in a way that everybody can see. Okay, maybe we do it like this. Okay, so let's see. So it's a little bit complicated. Good. So this is our model. And here is the, the simulation script. Here we can see the, the two m the two cars. Um, and there, the map here, as you can see on the model, is the same as it, is, as it is represented up here. So once I press this button, the first car will try to move. And so basically, they both try to reach their end destination. Um, and let's see what happens. Okay. So, what happened now? If you paid close attention, you could see that there was a new modeling element placed on the modeling tool. So the, the first car is trying to reach this uh, element, but there is an obstacle on the, in the real world. So now I have to call Anna up there to remove this obstacle. <laughs> Hopefully I have a connection here, yes. Hello, Anna. There is an obstacle in my live demonstration. Could you please remove it? Thank you very much. So, now we can see the first car continued its movement. If you paid close attention, I know, know the resolution is not perfect. But, and now, because there was this incident, uh, the modeler has to interact with the model. He now has to take over this process and have, has to steer the car in the right direction. So now I can try to move the mouse, and I can say, okay, now I select the second car. 
and I want the second car to move. Ah, right. Okay, now I have to be careful that they not crash into each other. So what, which one should I use? Should I try car one or is this huh, very close? Really? Yes. It's going to be close. Yes. Yeah, sure. <laughs> because I like this. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> now. Ah. ah. Uh, now I car one, not two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, this can be a problem. Um, okay, let's try car one again. Aha, okay, I think maybe... Uh -huh. I think Anna is getting nervous at the moment. <laughs> I think because it's actually oriented a little bit at an odd angle, maybe it cannot find the second street. Well, let's try again. Try again. I, but I think this is, this is as far as the demonstration goes, unless, yeah. So uh, I can try to use car two, maybe, or call Anna. Yeah, but, I got you. yeah, but I think this will be an accident. Well, yeah, it's nice. <laughs> if something can happen at all. <laughs> ah, yeah. <laughs> uh, human reacts automatically. <laughs> okay, I think. Yes, okay. Maybe maybe uh, one uh, one one last try, yes. Maybe car one is broken now. No. Yeah, maybe. Okay, I think I, I stopped the live demo. Car, car two, car two. Car two again. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, Anna, Anna, <laughs> Anna is not having it. Okay, basically the, the idea would be to park them. Again, car two again, really. <laughs> this was not how we scripted this. Ah, it's, now it's something. It says no. Maybe I have to drive away with car one. Why don't you select the destination of car one? Well, it depends on the script on how it is implemented. Of course, in this case, we do single steps, but it would also, if we write a more fancy other script, it would be possible to select the destination. And the, the window asks you to put uh, for car two at least the uh, destination. So ah, you think this is the problem? Yeah, maybe. I can try. You mean car one? Uh -huh. <laughs> I think I think we stop it at this point. Because I have more demonstration than this one here. <laughs> okay. So the, the problem with this thing is also because I, maybe the problem was that I tested it two times before the presentation and now the batteries are running low. Mm. So the motor are not as powerful anymore. But I think the, the main point was if you have a more sophisticatedly engineered cyber-physical system, you can, via microservices and via what I presented, you can integrate it very easily into conceptual models. Of course, then you have to worry about how, how the system works. 
Okay, so my second, the second experiment that I would like to present, uh, the sim a similar concept, but a different use case. So in this case, we talk about smart manufacturing. And again, there is a runtime environment, which is easily identified on this picture. So we have a robotic arm, and we have some ingredients that we want to assemble in this cup. And the scenario is that uh, uh, a user or a modeler can model a coffee process. So this coffee process would be invariant of any coffee that is ordered. But he also wants the option that he creates one single instance of coffee based on this model. So here is how this could look like. So again, we have our models of concepts, uh, which in this case are an extension of BPMN and our model that uses concept, concepts. So here you can see the standard elements of BPMN, and here is the extension, right? So we had to define these concepts. Now, what are the smart characteristics of these models? As you can imagine, there is very little or very informal information in this model. So here, the user just selects the coffee, the type of coffee. And then the whole, the model has to know, okay, in this type of coffee, and in this kind of coffee pad, this kind of milk, this kind of sugar, and so on. So the, there has to be an automatic enrichment of knowledge for this models, model. Um, also, there is a integration of a very generic process model that is invariant of any coffee produced, and a specific execution instance, right? This, this model actually combines two things, one invariant BPMN thing and the thing that is the specific instance of execution. Um, it's a combination, a connection between business requirements and cyber-physical system capabilities. So here we have some requirements and the requirement is just make a coffee of a specific sort. And the capabilities of the machine are just, I can move to A, I can move down, I can move up, left, right, can create some suction with this suction cup, but that's it. Somehow this has to be matched. Um, and there are also some reasoning capabilities based on the structure of the cyber-physical system. What kind of capabilities does it have? Um, the goal, again, is a transformation of informal knowledge, as is found in the APMN model, and more formal knowledge, information, and data. And like this, bridge the gap between conceptual models and cyber-physical systems. Now, what did we do to get to this point is that first we extended the BPMN meta model, which you, for example, can find on the ADOXX homepage. So we extended BPMN with domain-specific concepts, like with the play button, with the cup. Um, so this is the execution environment, is the play button and the stop button, and the domain-specific elements is this cup that the user wants to have. And then we provide a modeling tool for the extended BPMN, just like you did in the exercises today. So you're an expert, you are well known in this area. And then we use the modeling tool, we built this extended BPMN model, and we put it into operation. Um, and the difference in this, ex uh, in this experiment, as to the previous experiment, is that we try to conclude a, a general concept, this meta-modeling building block from this experiment. So in the previous experiment, we had some, added some functionality on the tool level. Now we try to build a meta-model building block. But again, the concept for the experiment is very, very similar. Again, we have our HTTP requests that come from a ADO script, from the extended BPMN model that also uses some knowledge transformation components. And we need a security token so that not everybody can use this ARM. So we have some very basic low-level security, and the ARM is again operated by a Raspberry that offers microservices. And like this, we integrate the conceptual model with the... Hmm. Yes, because we also have the Olive microservice portal, so it was maybe... A pro it was two reasons. One was pragmatic, so we have a microservice portal that operates on HTTP requests. So we decided to reuse this infrastructure. 
And the second one is, of course, we could have implemented some more low-level protocols. And at the beginning, we also did this. But low-level protocols, they are efficient, but they are a hassle. And you have to define a protocol. Yes. And over, like, if you look 10 years into the future, what is going to remain? Are these, going, are these very basic low-level protocols still going to be relevant? Or is everybody, everything going on to this web layer? Because it's very cheap and also energy efficient to some sort to add the Raspberry to the system. It costs you $5 and suddenly you have these whole capabilities of the web. You can do web tunnels, web tunnels or you can do HTTP requests. But yes, this is correct. This is correct. And if you build an industry plant, you have to make this decision very well. But I think it's not the same for all cases, but I think going into the future, it will shift more towards this more abstract HTTP layer. Maybe, but maybe this is just my opinion. But I think these devices get cheap, more, more and more cheaper and more and more energy efficient, so why not just edit on the, on the thing? Unless you need really exact, really fast performance to the maximum efficiency. Um, so here is the setup that we did. This was a more uh, inclusive study. So we, we thought about some scenes, or we used this design thinking approach and conceptual modeling on the one side, and microservices and cyber physical systems, and this Olive microservice part, portal on the other side. Um, so we call this service driven enrichment. Uh, and meta model based conceptual modeling, and we tried to combine these two things. And there is a, when we try to combine this, there is an engineering <coughs> question and a conceptual question is where is this point where you combine these things, like the colleague maybe asks. And the, the more things you implement on the, on the cyber physical systems on, in this runtime environment, the less you have to implement on the models. But this is not our approach. Our approach is to have the, the cyber physical systems as silly, as atomic, as simple as possible and have all the processing done on the model layer. Why? The analogy is that uh, if you look back at, the, at computers, at early computers, you programmed them with a sampler. Um, this assembler language defines some very primitive atomic things that can be then used by more uh, sophisticated programming languages. So we don't try to make this machine, these circuits more uh, clever, but we try to make this cleverness on a more abstract level. Mm. Okay, so what was necessary for this experiment? Like I mentioned, the extended BPMN model, which I already have shown, and there was a model type for cyber physical systems and a model type for connectivity. Um, so this is the model type for cyber physical systems, which enabled us to model the components of a cyber physical system. And based on these components, we could reason the capabilities of this system. Like if it has four wheels, it can drive. It, if it does not have wheels, it cannot drive. Uh, which is important if we think about semantic integration in the end. Um, and here is a model of connectivity where this does two things. For one, it reasons the capabilities from the uh, components. And for the second, it transforms the informal knowledge from the business model, like the user wants a coffee, into more concrete actions that are then executed by the machine. Um, OK, and here is, I think, the, the result. Down here, you can see again, in this case, it's not a live demonstration, but just a video that I made of this arm and the model. So the user just clicks this play button, and the model is executed. And then you get feedback in the model that the process has finished. Um, now, this was done, the, like I mentioned, 
uh, the first ex um, experiment was on a tool level. Just added some, add this DLL, and any of your tools can use this. This experiment was on the meta model level, so we defined a meta model building block uh, that provided this functionality. So again, you can have a meta model building block for BPMN or UML or whatever. And we defined a meta model building block for this execution environment, which then you can combine these two meta model building blocks and you get an executable BPMN model. Okay. Ah, yes. And this meta model building block was the, so was the first we specified it in the modeling language that Professor Karganis introduced. Chochako, maybe? <laughs> Pochako. Um, so this is the first building block that w went through this very rigorous specification. I bet this is a beta version of the tool, so maybe it looks a little bit different now. Yeah, but again, you can see, you can define it on the meta model you want to define on different hierarchical levels. So this should remind you of the introductory slides. Here again, have the scenario layer, the runtime environment, and some kind of connectivity based on conceptual models and the execution environments. So then we go one level in detail. Uh, this is the execution environment that we defined in this modeling language for meta models. Um, and it was already published, or it's going to be published. It was already presented. Uh, and the idea is that we have from conceptual models, can be any conceptual model. You, when you add this building block, you can define capability requirements. And there is some semantic alignment proce procedure to the capabilities of cyber-physical systems. Now, this is not uh, specified in detail. There is another, like the, the tool of Professor Phil, uh, Semphis, is then, would be then fulfill a role like here in this position. So you could combine more meta model building blocks and get to a result. But the idea is to match the capability requirements and the semantic, semantic annotations of the capabilities which are abstracted from cyber physical systems. And I am not going into detail because we have too little time for this, but you can read it if you are interested. Um, this is uh, the result of this meta model building block, uh, or, or at least this would be the concept behind it, uh, that you can define a, a, a model here and you make some annotation, a semantic requirement. So you annotate this kind of uh, element here with a semantic requirement, and then there would be some automated matching to a capability of a cyber physical system. So like this, we could integrate this building block uh, with other building blocks um, and have a different result. So basically, it's the same result, so the same execution environment, but a different model. Uh, here we have... Uh, So the professor also showed this example very briefly. So here is some additional information. Yeah. And here is the same with the BPMN model. Right. In this case, the user always selects when to fire, and then the process is executed. In this case, he chooses no milk and no sugar, so basically it just picked up the coffee pad, and the process is finished. Okay, any questions so far? Yes. Ah, uh, yes. This is a very good question. There are two versions of this experiment. The first one uses an ontology to define all the positions and basically what the coffee consists of. The coffee needs this pad and this pad and this sugar. Um, 
There is a second version of this experiment, which is currently being developed, which uses a camera to detect all the objects, so you can just throw them there, and the arm will pick them up. Yes, with QR codes, it's very simple to do image recognition because QR codes are very easy to train. So it's not very simple, but it is reasonable, less complex than training a neural network to detect A, what kind of object is there, and B, where is the position. Okay, so right. the yes, so there are two versions. The one works with a neural network that tries to find the items and some ontology that says which items I need for which coffee. And the second one has fixed positions and informations about the items there. Yeah, good question. But the, I hope that the, the second version is finished until the end of the year. Hopefully. So maybe next summer school. Um, so if you have, still have power, there is a third experiment that I would like to present you. The, again, the concept is very similar. Um, in this case, we consider delivery on demand. The scenario, again, there is a scenario involved in the a runtime environment. So the scenario is delivery on demand plus some attributes. And the runtime environment, again, can be seen easily here. So again, we reuse the robotic arm and a different version of this robotic car. And some production line and some end products and so on. Mm. So this is the smart model concept, or the smart model. Here are the concepts of the smart models that we defined. Here are the model that uses concepts. So I give you a very quick idea of this model. The idea is that, again, somebody models a production process, and this production process is transformed, like the idea with print apps maybe, into a more concrete model, in this case, uh, to make this pizza, the arm has to do two kinds of movements always. Go to the item, pick it up, place it on the production line. So this is what this represents. Now it can happen that one item is out of stock. Then a process like this is spawned, where the, the system has to first send a message to the car. The car delivers the product because it is missing, the arm cannot reach one, and then only then the arm continues when the car says, I'm there. So the idea why is this a smart model is that between it coordinates between cyber physical systems, it manage the, manages the production in the, in the cloud, uh, it provides an intuitive user interface where the, somebody can follow the production process. Um, and it semantically enriches also the process and the products and the cyber-physical systems. Um, and the idea, again, is a little bit different. So the first one is on the tool level. The second one is we have a meta-model building block. The third one is we want to move uh, smart models into a cloud ecosystem. So we want to move away from this standalone uh, modeling application towards web, uh, web application and integrate uh, web-based modeling applications with other applications in the web. So this, I had some trouble showing this concept on a slide in a very intuitive manner. Uh, so I did it a little bit in an informal way. So I, I just said, OK, we move the ADRXX to the cloud, away from the standalone application towards cloud applications. And there is a controlling system also, a controlling system also in the cloud. And this system then communicates with the cyber physical systems, with the rover, and with the arm. And this is the technology behind this idea. Um, very briefly, you can find more information on the ADOXX website. But basically, this is your standard, standalone. ADOXX installation that can run somewhere. And then there is an extension that creates a web API of ADOXX. So this, this allows you to get away from this passive or from this active ADOXX component that is controlling the devices actively towards a component that can also receive incoming information without initiating first a, a HTTP request. 
Like there can be some other cloud application that just sends something to AWXX and so on. It's, it allows a more close integration into the cloud. Um, so this is the idea of this uh, experiment. So the, this web API allows web-based interaction with AWXX. This implementation is done in Java and the interface is either SOAP or REST. Um, you can execute ADO script commands uh, via these interfaces. Um, okay, and this is again maybe uh, uh, the involved components in this experiment. You can see again the scenario layer, the runtime environment, and the modeling layer. And these concepts are decomposed in ADOXX. So we have a production model and a model about products and cyber-physical systems that are controlled and we abstract this. Again, there are some tasks of cyber-physical systems and the cyber-physical system models themselves. But we want to get all this in, the, in, the, in this vertical software layer. We want to have a cloud uh, ecosystem where all of these blocks are managed. And again, there is a result video for this experiment. Okay, so there, uh, yeah, oh, what can I say? First, uh, these are the cyber physical system models and their capabilities. They are added to this cloud control system. And at some point there is a process defined, yes, here. And then this process is executed. Okay, and depending, these cyber-physical systems now play an active part that send information to ADOXX on their own. And ADOXX reacts on this kind of information and shows the current situation of, of the process. And you can see there, there was one product missing. The arm told the car it needs to deliver this uh, product and now the arm can continue. It's a pizza. Here, mock up pizza. Okay. And I think this is, I'm coming to an end. Um, my conclusions for these sessions. So we try, our community, we try to build smart models to integrate the activities on the scenario layer and on the runtime environment. Um, so we provide meta model building blocks and generic ADOXX functionality to achieve this goal and to support modeling method engineers and consequently modelers. Then the, the, the main, maybe the main aspect for researchers is that this gives us a way of evaluating research. So if we build these laboratories and if we execute the conceptual models with cyber-physical systems, we have ex post evaluation. So you can, do not have to do empirical evaluation all the time, but you can also apply different uh, validation methods. So basically, if you build something like this, you, have an, uh, you also have an evaluation environment, which I think, think can be very powerful. And then I have some additional information. There are many more experiments that were conducted, some of which are online, where you can find more information. So there are systems around fuzzy logic, around rule engines, uh, around image recognition, and so on. So this brings me to the end. I would like to thank you for participating today. And if you have any questions, uh, please ask me. Thank you.
I think you. Hmm. I think the, you have the same problem if you encode. So an error can occur on any level. So if you implement it on the, it, for me it makes no difference where I implement this logic. Whether I program it on the on the model level, it's more easy to maintain there. Then the question is, how do I synchronize these two things? So maybe there is an error happening in a more lower level. And they need to react on this error on a more higher level. This is what you are saying. We can lose communication, we can lose connection to the yes. device. Yes, okay. We cannot predict yes. the behavior of this device. Yes, so, so two answers. The first one is, this is a problem of alignment. Maybe we have to have some atomic functionality on device that cares for connectivity. And the second one, we need some kind of exception handling on the modeling layer. And there is a project working on that. So this is a... Uh, an excuse of an answer because it's not finished yet. But basically the same thing we do with the program language is there, if there is an error happening somewhere down the line, we want to capture, react on this in a more higher level, react on this exception, cap capture it and react accordingly. But we do have a project working on this at the moment, trying to define these exceptions on the, on the modeling layer, like uh, developing this exception framework. But it's a master. So, before master thesis yet, yeah. Please. Yeah, I mean, when you're talking about the conception modeling here, I, at one level, I don't like this type of demonstration. It's much like traditional, or something like robot demonstration. What I'd really like to see is changing the conception model quickly and seeing how the robot can change without having a little coding in it. Because I started working in robotics with mm -hmm. about high flexibility for some of the lines like in the 90s. And when we, when we moved to an optical oriented <coughs> But that would revolutionize the, the process because before then they'd have to code find it and they'd tear it apart and go back up. And this is close to that. But what I would really like to see is that if you've got, if you've got a set of concepts, could you really quickly set one up, have it do a demonstration, change the conceptual model, and then have the machine pick it up again? And that would be exciting to see because it's now, it's not just like I'm watching a robot arm doing something. But I think that's the value in the industry because I really want to see something that's easier to, than I have to sit down and manually program it. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not just not seeing that value in this demonstration. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I know it's there, but I'm not seeing it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm happy that you... Thank you. But yes, but the, 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 it's a very good question. Um, the problem is that on the conceptual level, you have very, this very semi-formal knowledge. So it's very hard to make a direct connection between the semi-formal knowledge, of, as you know, and the kind of information processing that is required on the machine level. So somehow you have to make this transition. And we use, for example, semantic technologies. So we use the semantic web framework to make this connection. 
in a in a way like you mentioned that you can change the concepts, the models that are made with these concepts, and then you match it using the semantic web stack. But that is not perfect. That is some kind of reasoning. Um, like I mentioned to your colleague, we also explore the options of, of machine learning in this case, but it is a very hard problem, I think. 